Hi there, everyone from West Whit Hills Christian Church. Thank you for joining us again this wonderful Lord's Day. Today's scripture reading is a tapestry of verse from the Psalms, the book of Jeremiah, and the Gospel of John. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. O oh Lord my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. May God Almighty deliver blessings both upon the reading and the hearing of his precious and holy word. And now, family, let us journey on over to Hope International University there in Fullerton, California. We will there be joined by our dear brother and pastor, Joe McCarthy. Pastor Joe. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be where you are. I guess I should say good now, because whenever you're watching this for you, it's right now, which a little philosophical here. It's really all we got is now. The past is history. The future is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. You've heard me say that before. But I truly believe it. I'm learning to live it, live in this moment, because this is the only moment I have. The past has brought us to where we are, right? We are the accumulation of our decisions and our experiences. And that has brought us to this moment. But the future is uncertain. It's unknown. The possibilities are truly limitless. We have the power, the gift that God has given us to choose. What do we do with the knowledge and the experience and the memories that we bring to this moment? It's not determined yet. And God gives us the amazing power to choose. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do next? I pray that the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you through me, touches you deep down in your soul, refreshes you, replenishes you, refuels you for your journey. So today I wanna to talk about a very dear friend of mine, someone I've known as long as I can remember. I'm going to tell his story and just uh, to protect his identity, I'm gonna change his name and you'll understand why as the story unfolds. I'm gonna call him Wayne. When Wayne was little, grew up in a family that was low to medium income. They lived in a trailer park, his older sister, younger brother, and his family was Dysfunctional, as Wayne likes to say, takes the they took the fun out of dysfunction, right? And and so there was lots of turmoil in his home. He's a very happy kid, full of life and vim and vigor. And his parents split up. I guess when he was around six or seven years old, and his mom got remarried when he was eleven, and from age eleven, twelve, and thirteen. Wayne lived in a, a very emotionally abusive situation with his stepfather, who said all sorts of nasty things to him and really kind of crushed his spirit, crushed his soul. So Wayne survived that, of course, um, but not without repercussions on, on his identity and his sense of worth. And then after three years of that, uh, Wayne's family started going to a different church in town. And Wayne really became good friends with the music minister at the church, who was like Wayne, very musical, gregarious, and outgoing, and very happy, and really became a, a mentor and a friend and a father figure to Wayne. Um, but unfortunately, after some time passed, a year or two maybe, I guess, things uh, 
went dark in that relationship and uh, the music pastor took advantage of that friendship, that relationship with Wayne and molested him a few different times. And as Wayne tells the story, he was totally unprepared for that, had no, didn't even cross his mind that that was a possibility. So when things happened inappropriately, he didn't know what to do or what to say, who to tell. And then when it happened more than once, then it became a secret, like this big secret that he held because he was ashamed, ashamed of what had happened, ashamed that he hadn't told anybody, that he hadn't done anything about it. And Wayne just thought, well, I'll just, I'll suck it up. Trust that God's here somewhere. And then his, Wayne's mom noticed that something was wrong with him. Wayne was always a good student and his grades were faltering and Wayne was very involved in his youth group and his band and sports and he just didn't seem like he wanted to do that stuff as much as he used to. So his mom kept asking him, Wayne, are you all right? Is everything okay? And Wayne kind of blew it off. But eventually, uh, with his mom's persistence and mom giving him a loving place, a safe, supportive place to tell his story, uh, Wayne revealed a little bit of what was going on. And his mother, of course, very protective of Wayne, said, let's go, well, let's go talk to the lead pastor at the church. He'll know what to do. So Wayne's mom and Wayne went to the pastor and told him what was going on. Not all the sordid details, but that the music pastor was taking advantage of Wayne, who was 15 at the time, and left it in the lead pastor's hands to do what, whatever was appropriate. A couple of months later, the music pastor was gone, apparently moved off to another state. And that certainly was helpful to Wayne. He re-entered you know, his activities and got very involved again with the youth group and the sports and the music and really was very outgoing and uh, successful in many outward respects. But inward, uh, Wayne was broken. There's parts of him that were crushed and confused, couldn't really make sense of what had happened or why. And Wayne tells me that there are times when he would go into his room many times, both when he was uh, in the situation with his stepfather and also with this music pastor. And he'd just pray and cry and ask God, what's going on? I don't understand it, why? And as Wayne tells it, the only response he really clearly heard and from his to his prayers was just the sense that God's saying, I'm here, I got you. I know I'm here. No, no particular instructions as to what to do differently and no force field to protect Wayne. Uh, nothing happened particularly to change the circumstances. But Wayne did have a sense that God saw him, understood. I've known Wayne again like since he was young, really young, and he never really lost faith. Lots of questions, of course, but never really interpreted these as circumstances as an abandonment of God for him. Just didn't really understand why things were going the way they were. And again, God's answer to Wayne was, I'm here, I got you. So fast forward, Wayne grows up, he goes to Bible college, studies for ministry, travels the world, and finally gets married, settles down, and kind of thinking that all of that was in his past, uh, turns out not so much, right? As Wayne describes it, he started to realize that it was like he was operating with only three limbs. Like one of his arms was tied to his side and he hadn't even really noticed. So he learned to compensate and was able to function with just one arm, two legs. Uh, but it wasn't until his marriage started to unravel relationship with his wife um, was pretty tattered and torn and raw um, that Wayne realized at some point 
Uh, if I don't get some help, uh, I think my marriage is doomed, which is the last thing Wayne wanted. He came from a broken family. He knew how much damage that would cause, not only to himself and his wife, but to his kids. So I went to therapy to see if things could be salvaged. And one of the therapy sessions Wayne was sent to, um, they did this psychological drama role-playing exercise. And as Wayne describes it, um, it was this situation where the people that were going through counseling recreated the scene uh, where the deepest traumas had happened in their childhood. But rather than playing themselves in the scene, people would role play uh, together. And the person whose trauma they were role playing, everyone would have a part, except for the person who experienced the trauma, they would not play themselves. Somebody else would play them. And they would play either an adult that was there at the time when the trauma happened or or a new person, a new adult, or even themselves now as an adult, who then would go into the scene and and rescue their child, their inner child, uh, in the moment that the trauma was happening. And super powerful for Wayne. He says that, you know, he wasn't expecting it, but it was this uh, almost a supernatural sense of freedom and healing and understanding when in his role play, he stepped into the scene as an adult that wasn't there when the trauma actually had happened and rescued his inner child, pulled him out of the situation and made it clear that that could never happen again to the perpetrator and called the police and helped Wayne get to therapy. And Wayne says it was just a transformative moment in his life where he went from this victim and he'd been victimized, so a victim, his life, the victim mentality, to empowered, right? To be able to rescue himself, his inner child, from that trauma. And things didn't turn around for Wayne overnight, but that was the beginning of a new chapter, a new mentality. Wayne said that in therapy, before he got to that particular exercise, that his therapist helped him understood that because of what had happened in his, in his childhood, there was an effect called arrested development where he hadn't really fully grown into a mature man in some emotional areas because uh, of the effect of the abuse. And as his therapist explained, Wayne's ability to adapt and to survive uh, terrible trauma was really a superpower as a child. Um, but because that was so effective then, Wayne just hung on to that, right? and. Um, wasn't really serving him well now as an adult, as a, as an employee, as a dad, or as a husband. So it's time to heal that wound and get the use of that limb that had been taped down, had been wounded, and to heal it and bring it into use. God had been with him all along, never did abandon him, but that didn't mean that Wayne didn't need to do some work, right? To, get some help and to understand that what served him well in the moment as a child uh, wasn't serving him anymore. In fact, it was now a liability. And uh, so it's been an amazing journey to witness, to watch, and to see the transformation that's happening in Wayne's life even today. Um, still got a ways to go, as Wayne would say in his own words, but <laughs> on a much better path, not stuck in those traumatic moments of his childhood any longer. And so as some of you may know, based on stories you've heard from my own life, um, or because you're listening and you know me, I am Wayne. That's my middle name, Joseph Wayne McCarthy. This is my story, but it's also my history, right? It's in the past. And yet the word history to me has come to mean something completely new and wonderful and healing and restorative. And that's the word history itself. The first three letters are his, H-I-S. History, my history is also his story, his being my savior. Jesus 
History has brought me to where I am, right? But it doesn't determine where I go next. And when I allow my history to become his story, history, and integrate it into the bigger story of what Jesus has done for all of humanity, but for me individually, but that really does change everything. In fact, that gives me the power to make better choices now with what I'll do with my life today and tomorrow. And as long as God allows me to travel this earth. And it's interesting because a lot of people ask me, well, Joe, when this stuff was happening, didn't you feel like God abandoned you? Why did you cling to your faith through all of that? <laughs> a couple answers have come to mind. Uh, one is, what else was I gonna cling to, right? When my world is crumbling around me and people are, are proving to be unreliable, what else do I have to cling to? But my firm belief that the Bible is true and that the God of the Bible doesn't just love the whole world, but loves each one of us individually. And so in those prayers, when I was hurting and confused, and I was praying, God, why? Why me? Why is this happening? I didn't really understand how profound God's answer to me was. That I, I know, I see, I'm here. I am, right? It reminds me of when Moses asks God after the burning bush experience, well, if I'm going to go talk to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to wonder, on whose authority do I come? Who do I tell him sent me? And God says, I am. <laughs> I, I got to think that Moses is like, I am what? Right? Uh, can you finish the sentence? Seems like we're missing something here. And God just says, I am. I am that I am. And it dawns on me now that it's present tense. God says, I am. Not I was or I will be but I am, right? Ever present. I'm here. I am here now in this moment. So it's God saying to you who are listening, I am, I'm here. When Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, asked Jesus, why did Lazarus have to die? If he'd have just been here with us, he wouldn't have died. <laughs> Jesus says, well, do you believe in the resurrection? Mary and Martha, I forget which one. They say, yeah, of course, someday in the future, right? Yeah, when all things are, when we die, you know, you're gonna raise us all up to heaven. I believe that. And Jesus says, listen carefully, Martha, or Mary, whichever one it was. I am the resurrection and the life. Not I will be, it's not in the future, not I was, I am the ever-present resurrection and life and suddenly after all these years of reading the bible and following god's leading on my life and all the sermons i've heard i hear those words differently than i've ever heard them before jesus says i am the resurrection right now i am the resurrection i am the resurrection and the life this is huge it's much bigger than i ever ever understood but not only is the resurrection not something that will happen after I'm dead, although the Bible does say that is true as well. But Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection right here, right now, and the life. These are present tense things, right? I am the resurrection. I, <laughs> I bring life from death, goodness from badness, light from darkness, right here, right now, not someday. Not that I will be the resurrection, I am. It just, boom, hits me. Like the light bulb finally turns on. The resurrection is not an event. The resurrection is a person. And that person is ever present. To use the scriptural words, an ever present help in time of trouble. <laughs> mm. The psalmist would say, my hope is is you, God. I used to sing this song by Third Day a lot when I was a worship leader. And I got the words wrong. I didn't even look that closely because grammatically it made sense for me to sing, my hope is in you, which it is. My hope is in Christ. But the words really are, 
as the psalmist would say, my hope is you. Jesus, my Savior, my hope is you. After Jesus is alive, after he died and crucified, and he's in the grave for days just like Lazarus, Jesus comes back from the grave to prove once and for all that all the things that he said are true, right? That he is the Son of God. But he does hold the power over death and the grave and that it's available to each of us, not just when we die, but right now and right now and right now that Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Whatever's dead in you, I can bring to life right now, <laughs> not at the end of time. I am the resurrection, not I will be, right? But what really struck, strikes me now is when Jesus is alive after he died and rose again. His disciples are hearing the stories, right? And some of them had seen Jesus in person. And Thomas, who wasn't there on the first, his first appearances after Jesus' death, he's pretty skeptical. Well, who wouldn't be? Never seen anybody raised from the dead before. This seems way too good to be true, right? Can this actually be true? And so Thomas says what I think many of us would feel, I'll believe it when I see it. In fact, I don't think I'm gonna believe it until I can actually touch the scars in Jesus' hands and his feet. And then Jesus, of course, he shows up in a room, appears in a room, like walks through the walls or whatever he does. And he appears in front of the disciples now with Thomas in the room and he holds out his hands and he says to Thomas, here's the scars, here's the wounds, the nail holes in his hands, his feet, his side. And he says, you wanted to see it? You wanted to touch it? Go ahead. Thomas falls to his knees and says the words that we all have to say at some point when the realization comes that Jesus didn't just die on the cross, but he died for me and he didn't stay there but he busted out of the grave and offers new life to us right now, right here. And he says, look, I'm wounded too. You wanna to touch him? You wanna see him? Thomas falls to his knees, my Lord, my God, right? There's no question now. There's no doubting Thomas anymore, right? Thomas goes on like all the other disciples to live a life proclaiming this truth even to their own peril. And I can only imagine when the disciples are tortured and imprisoned and crucified upside down. That's what's Peter and stoned to death, Stephen. That they were tempted to ask the same questions that I did when I was wounded. Where are you, God? Why is this happening? Jesus holds out his nail scarred hand and says, I'm here and I get it. I know what that's like. I was wounded too. I was a victim. Not because of anything that I had done, but willingly offered myself as a sacrifice so that by my wounds, by my stripes, you can be healed. Scripture, by his stripes, we are healed. Not we will be healed, we are healed. Does it feel like it sometimes? No. Do I live in the fullness of that promise? No, but it's available to me. And it's an ever present revelation in my life that God loves me and by his wounds, I am healed. And perhaps I don't feel that way. Perhaps I don't act that way all the time. I don't, but it's available to me now and now and now, and it's available to you now and now and now. Mm. We have a God who not only sees us, who is with us, but who has felt our pain, rejection, betrayal, abuse, trauma. <laughs> Mine doesn't compare to what Jesus experienced, of course, but I take great comfort in knowing that he not only sees me, sees what I'm going through, but he has experienced it and overcome it, right? So when Jesus says, I am the resurrection, he is talking about at the end of time and he's also talking about now. I am the resurrection. He's offering that to you and to me, saying whatever's dead in you, whatever's wounded, whatever's broken, whatever's arrested 
in its development. That arm, Joe, that's been tied against your side, I can set it free. I have come to set you free. This is the truth. Oftentimes I think we are too limited in our understanding of what it means to be adopted into God's family. And we view salvation as a moment of time where you, you say a prayer and you ask God to forgive your sins and to live in your heart. And you think that's it, that's, that's what defines me. But that's not even the reality of what we live in. Every day, every moment is a new opportunity, right? To experience the resurrection power <laughs> that Jesus says, I am the resurrection. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Lives, that's a present tense. It lives in me. So I may not be operating <laughs> on all those cylinders, but they're there. So my prayer for me, my prayer for you, is God continue to reveal that truth, that truth that keeps on truthing, the truth that sets me free, that Jesus is, that God is the great I am, ever present help in time of trouble and that the resurrection power is available to me, to you in each and every micro moment of our lives. We do not have to live as victims any longer because death and hell and the grave and the hatred and the abuse is the past. It has brought us to where we are now, but it does not determine where we're going. And in the now is Jesus who says, I am here. I know, I see you, I get it. I've felt it, I, I've got my own wounds, right? And by my wounds, you're healed, set free, limitless. And eternity begins now. So God help us to embrace that. Continue to reveal that truth that keeps on truthing that my salvation isn't determined by a moment. My salvation is available to me every moment, every breath, every time I blink, every time I breathe, everything that I do, everything that I think. And that God, you have brought me safe thus far. Your grace, right? Your grace has brought me safe thus far. I'm still alive, not unscarred, but I resemble you. My God, you are scarred as well. And yet you have shown me that scars don't define me, right? In fact, now instead of hiding them and trying to pretend that they're not there, I can stand and show them as Jesus did and say, they don't define me. I am not my scars. They are a part of who I was and who I am, but they don't determine who I'm becoming any longer. I've been set free. That's the truth that keeps on truthing, the truth that sets me free, right? <laughs> it's remarkable. It's transformative. It's salvation every breath, every micro moment. So my relationship with God is not defined by a prayer or a moment in time. It's defined now and now and now. For many years of my life, I was walking wounded. And God, with his love and tenderness and healing power and persistence, is helping me understand that now I'm a wounded warrior. I'm not denying the fact that I've got wounds. We all do. But my wounds are no longer just something to hide and to be ashamed of. They are my trophies. They are a testimony of God's power to take what others meant for evil, what Satan meant for evil, and use it for good as only he can. It's miraculous. From walking wounded to wounded warriors. He binds the brokenhearted right now. Binds their wounds 
<laughs> sets the captives free. I'm sure you can identify with that on some level. Brokenhearted, captive to your own mind, your sins, your choices, your trauma. Jesus is here, there, now, to bind up your broken heart, to set you free. Receive it, believe it. My story, your story, our story is history. It's in the past. But when it becomes his story, it becomes the present. Our past doesn't determine our future. It's determined how we got to here, but it does not determine where we go from here. And we go from history with a small h to his story with a capital H-I-S. The possibilities are unlimited. And let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we call on you and your magnificent power. You are our helper. We reach up to embrace your spirit of comfort and joy as we intercede in prayer for all who are struggling with feelings of despair. Grow within each of us seeds of praise that sprout through the obedience and following and worshiping you, Lord. Help each of us to put our faith in you, to seek you with humble hearts, hearts that bow to that name that is higher than all names, Jesus our Lord, our bread of life and our living water. We pray these things in the almighty power and glory of Jesus' name forever. Amen. So we thank you so much for joining us today, and we pray that you go this week with the living water and the bread of life.